gives us access to a world of colors and brightness. According to a Latin lyric poet, Horace, what we learn only through the years makes less impression upon our minds than what is presented to the trustworthy eye. That is probably why the eye is also called the jewel of the body. In this lesson, you will learn about the structure and working of a human eye, defects of vision and the remedies for these defects. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to explain the structure and working of a human eye, identify the significance of the power of accommodation, identify the causes and symptoms of a cataract, Explain the need for two eyes. Identify the common defects of vision. Myopia, hypermetropia and presbyopia. Identify the corrective measures to deal with the defects of vision. Define power of a lens. And identify the expression for determining the power of a lens. You can identify a flower by smelling and touching it. But you can't identify a color without the sense of vision. Hear that honking sound? It's probably a car coming around the corner, right? Can you guess what kind of a car it is? Not really. Not without looking at it. The human eye is the organ of sight for human beings. Your eye transforms light waves reflected from objects that you see into images. The information about these images is then sent to your brain. Based on this information, your brain creates a picture of what you look at. This is how your eye enables you to see. Your eyes can also sense geographic directions movement and color of objects and light sources. In a technical sense, your eye can be considered an optical device, that is, an instrument of vision that detects light. Let's look at how this optical device works. First, we'll examine the structure of the eye. A human eye is spherical in shape with a diameter of approximately 1 inch. It constitutes about 30 major and minor parts. Let's start with the sclera or sclerotic. Sclera is a tough white fibrous tissue that protects and contains the internal parts of the eye. The next part is the cornea, a tough membrane covering the front surface of the eye that is bulged out. The cornea refracts the light that enters the eye. Behind the cornea lies a jelly-like substance called the aqueous humor. It enables the eye to cope with the changes in the atmospheric pressure. The iris forms the colored part of the eye. The iris adjusts the size of a tiny hole called the pupil to control the amount of light entering the eye. The next part of the eye is the crystalline lens. The crystalline lens is a transparent biconvex structure in the eye, which, along with the cornea, helps to refract light so that it can be focused on the retina. The ciliary muscle is a ring-like structure attached to the iris. It helps focus images by contracting or relaxing as required to change the shape and focal length of crystalline lens. Thus, it ensures proper vision 
by changing the focal length of the eye lens based on the distances of objects in the line of vision. The space between the lens and the retina in the eye is filled with a clear, dense, jelly-like fluid called vitreous humor. The vitreous humor helps focus the image clearly on the retina and maintains the shape of the eye. The innermost part of the eye is called the retina. The retina may be considered as the screen where an image is formed when light passes into the eye. The retina is spread all through the interior of the eye behind the lens, forming a canopy of the nerve endings of the optical nerves. The retina contains two main types of light-sensitive cells, called rods and cones. Through optical nerves, the retina connects the eye to the brain. When retina receives an optical image, it converts the image into optical impulses and relays these impulses to the brain through the optical nerve. The brain then interprets these signals to an image of the object viewed through the eye. That's how the eyes help us to see. Here is a quick summary of the various parts of the eye and their functions. Now let's see how these parts come together to help us see when we are looking at something. When light rays reflect from an object towards an eye, the cornea refracts these rays so that they are incident on the lens. The cornea is responsible for maximum refraction of the light incident on the eye. With the help of involuntary movement of the ciliary muscles, the iris and the pupil control the light entering the eye and incident on the lens. The crystalline lens, being biconvex in nature, refracts the light rays it receives. It helps in final focusing of the light on the retina to form a real image. The retina converts the light energy of the image into electrical impulses using light-sensitive nerve cells called rods and cones. The rod cells are responsible for the perception of the brightness of light and the cone cells for the perception of color. The electric impulses from the retina are relayed to the brain by the optic nerve. These impulses indicate the brightness and color of the image to the brain. The brain interprets these impulses and produces the sense of vision. Sounds like a long process, doesn't it? The amazing thing is that the eye completes this process in a fraction of a second, enabling us to see. The way your eye enables you to see is very similar to the functioning of another common optical device, the camera. To form images, all SLR cameras use the same principles of refraction of light rays by lenses and interpretation of colors and brightness. Similar to the iris in the eye, a camera has an iris diaphragm to control the light entering the camera. The screen that contains a photographic film in a camera is similar to the retina in the eye. When we use a camera to ensure clarity of images, we adjust the focal length of its lens based on the distance of the object. How does your eye do that? What happens when you switch from reading a newspaper to looking at the television at the end of the room? Or look up to see a plane in the sky? As mentioned earlier, ciliary muscles help obtain the focus of objects located at different distances. 
Your eye can change the focal length of the lens in a fraction of a second when you look at another object. This ability of the eye to change focus for objects at different distances by altering the curvature of the lens is called accommodation. For an object to be seen clearly, the image must be formed on the retina. The distance between the lens and the retina is fixed. So, how do you think the eye is able to focus on objects at different distances? Remember the relation between the object distance u, image distance v, and focal length f of a lens? Let's refresh your memory. The relation between the object distance u, image distance v, and focal length f is represented by the expression 1 divided by f is equal to 1 divided by v minus 1 divided by u. In this relation, all distances are measured from the center of the lens. Applying this formula for the eye, image distance is the distance between the lens and the retina, which remains constant. The object distance is the distance of the object from the eye lens, which may vary. Therefore, to form a clear image of different objects at different distances from the eye, the focal length of the eye lens has to be changed. And how do we do that? By altering its thickness, of course. For example, to focus on a distant object, the eye needs to increase the focal length of the lens. To do this, the thickness of the lens should be decreased. Conversely, to decrease the focal length, the thickness of the eye lens should be increased. To accomplish this task, ciliary muscles are used. The contraction and relaxation of these muscles helps to alter the curvature of the lens. For instance, let's revisit the scenario when a person switches from reading the paper to looking at the television at the end of the room. As the television set is relatively far from the eye, the light rays from the television are almost parallel and do not require much convergence to be focused on the retina. Hence, the focal length of the crystalline lens needs to be increased to focus on the images on the television. In such situations, the ciliary muscles relax. This decreases the lens thickness. In turn, increasing the focal length for clear vision. On the other hand, the light rays from an object located close to the eye, like the newspaper, are divergent and require relatively more convergence. Therefore, to focus on such objects, the focal length of the lens should be decreased. This happens when the lens is comparatively thicker. Therefore, to focus on objects closer to the eye, in this case, the newspaper, the ciliary muscles contract. This increases the lens thickness, in turn decreasing the focal length. In this way, accommodation of lens helps us to focus on objects at different distances and see things clearly. So, think about what happens when Jerry switches from looking at the sunset to solving his physics problems. Do you think his ciliary muscles need to work in this scenario. Let's see. Looking at the sunset, Jerry is seeing a distant object. However, when he works on his physics questions, he is looking at his notebook closer to his eyes. The ciliary muscles in his eyes will need to accommodate this change in distance. Long exposure of the eyes to ultraviolet light, effects of diabetes, hypertension and old age can result in a condition called cataract. People suffering from cataract 
display a cloudy translucent eye lens. Cataract affects the ability of the eye to accommodate the change of distances. As a cataract matures, the cloudiness on the lens increases. This reduces the amount of light entering the eye, resulting in significant loss of vision, sometimes blindness. An appropriate surgical procedure or laser treatment can rectify a cataract in most cases. So, how far does the power of accommodation of our eyes stretch? Can it accommodate images of objects at just about any distance? Not really. The power of accommodation provided by our eyes does have its limits. We cannot see distinct images of objects that are too far from or too near to our eyes. Far point is the maximum distance from the eye at which the eye can obtain a focused image of an object without straining. Similarly, near point is the minimum distance at which eye can obtain a focused image of an object without straining. This means that to view an object clearly, a minimum distance of the object from the eye should be ensured. This minimum distance required between the object and the eye to view the object comfortably is called the least distance of distinct vision. For a normal healthy eye, the least distance of distinct vision is 25 cm. Remember the times when your parents told you not to read in bed? Or to keep the book further away from your eyes? Do you understand why now? In order to avoid undue strain on our eyes, we all need to ensure a minimum distance of 25 cm between our eye and our books while reading. Considering what a single eye can achieve, don't you wonder why we need two eyes? Wouldn't one eye be enough to see all that we want to? Well, here are some interesting facts about your eyes. The horizontal field of view for a single eye is 150 degree. To provide a wider field of view, say 180 degree, you need to see with both your eyes. This happens because each eye receives a different image of an object on its retina. These images are about 2 inches apart. This is especially true when an object is close to your eyes. The brain can determine the exact location of the object by combining images from both eyes. This positioning of eyes, known as stereo vision position, helps us to see the maximum possible number of objects around us. Two eyes together provide you the visual ability to see the world in three dimensions. That is, they give you the ability to gauge depths. This is very useful while walking or judging distances. Try these activities to better understand the need of two eyes. Threading a needle with one eye closed. And catching a ball with one eye blindfolded. You will find yourself struggling with the thread. As for catching the ball while seen with only one eye, you should be very careful when catching the ball, or else the ball may hit you. This is because with one eye, you are likely to misjudge the distance. In a defect-free eye, light rays focus exactly on the retina, and the object that reflects the rays is therefore seen clearly. Thus, a defect-free eye provides sharply focused vision at all possible distances. However, you would have noticed that many people, as they grow older or sometimes even as kids, need the aid of contact lenses or spectacles to read or to see properly. 
That's because of eye defects. Some factors that can cause irregularities in vision are irregularities on the surface of the cornea, development of cataract, weakening of ciliary muscles, and change in the size of the eyeball. These irregularities can lead to three major types of vision defects myopia, hypermetropia, and presbyopia. Let's look at each of these defects in detail. Look at the image of the clock tower as it appears to Uncle Tom without his glasses. As you can see, the image is indistinct. This is because Uncle Tom is suffering from myopia. Myopia is a defect in which a human eye can see nearby objects clearly, but distant objects appear blurred and unclear. Myopia is also known as short-sightedness or near-sightedness. Myopia occurs when the converging power of the eye lens is higher than normal. In such cases, the ciliary muscles do not relax sufficiently. Due to this, the parallel light rays that are reflected from a distant object are focused at a position before the retina instead of on a position on the retina. So, how can you correct myopia? Myopia can be corrected by placing a suitable concave lens in the line of sight. When this is done, the parallel beam of light reflected from a distant object is first diverged by the concave lens and then converged by the eye lens to focus on the surface of the retina. The higher the power of the lens required, the heavier is the lens and the thicker is the edge of the lens. The rectification lens for myopia is also referred to as the diverging lens as it serves to correct the defect by diverging the incident light beam. Here is Mr. Smith enjoying a leisurely evening. He is able to see the tree across the road clearly. However, when he opens the newspaper, the newsprint appears blurred to him. Why does the newsprint appear blurred to Mr. Smith even though he can view the tree across the road clearly? Because his eyes are suffering from hypermetropia. Hypermetropia is a defect of vision in which a human eye has problems seeing objects located nearby clearly. However, an eye that has hypermetropia can see distant objects clearly. This condition is also known as long-sightedness or far-sightedness. Hypermetropia occurs when the converging part of the eye lens is less than normal. This happens because the ciliary muscles become weak and are unable to alter the lens size as required. Due to this, the parallel light rays that are reflected from any objects located nearby are focused at a position behind the retina instead of on the retina. So what's the solution for this condition? Like myopia, hypermetropia can be corrected by placing a suitable lens in the line of sight. However, in this case, you'd use a convex lens instead of a concave lens. When this is done, the parallel beam of light reflected from a nearby object is first converged by the convex lens and then by the eye lens to focus on the surface of the retina. The higher the power of the lens required, the thicker the center of the lens, and therefore the heavier the lens. The rectification lens for hypermetropia is also referred to as the converging lens, as it converges the beam of light incident on it. Now let's meet Mr. Foley. He is reading a book. 
Do you see anything unnatural about this scene? Mr. Foley seems to be holding the book unnaturally far, right? This could be because he is suffering from presbyopia. Presbyopia is a condition in which the crystalline lens of an eye loses its flexibility. Persons suffering from presbyopia are unable to read or see clearly, even at the least distance of distinct vision, which is 25 cm. Presbyopia occurs in old age, when the ciliary muscles lose the elasticity required to change the focus of an enlarged eye lens. Loss of flexibility makes it difficult for the eye to focus properly. That is, the accommodation of the normal eye is no longer applicable. This condition is a combination of myopia and hypometropia. To correct presbyopia, a bifocal lens is used. In a bifocal lens, the upper part is a concave lens to correct myopia. And the lower part is a convex lens to correct hypometropia. Other corrective measures for presbyopia include reading glasses, trifocals, or contact lenses. The corrective measures are chosen depending on whether any other eye defects are observed. As we mentioned earlier, defects of vision can be corrected using proper converging or diverging lens or a bifocal. So, exactly how thin or thick does a lens need to be? This depends on the power of the lens required, that is, the converging or diverging capacity required. The converging or diverging capacity depends on its focal length. For a higher converging or diverging capacity, we need lenses of a greater thickness, and hence a smaller focal length. Similarly, a thin convex lens has a larger focal length, and hence its convergence is lower. Thus, the converging capacity of a convex lens and its focal length are inversely related. Numerically, the power of a lens is the reciprocal of its focal length expressed in meter. The SI unit of power of a lens is diopter and is denoted by D. Usually, the focal length of a convex lens is considered positive. Hence, its power is also positive. Similarly, the focal length of a concave lens is considered negative. Hence, its power is negative as well. Therefore, individuals suffering from hypometropia use spectacles with positive power lenses. Similarly, those suffering from myopia use negative power lenses to correct their vision. We can determine the focal length of the corrective lens for myopia or hypometropia using the lens formula 1 divided by F equals 1 divided by V minus 1 divided by U. The power of the corrective lens is the reciprocal of its focal length, expressed in meters. The SI unit of power of a lens is diopter and is denoted by D. For example, if the focal length of a corrective convex lens is 80 cm or 0.8 m, its power is equal to the reciprocal of 0.8, which is 1.25 diopter. This brings us to the end of this lesson on the human eye. In this lesson, you have learned about structure and working of a human eye, defects of vision and their correction, and power of lenses. To revisit the key points covered in this lesson, please review the flashcard at the end of this lesson.
Hey, look, a rainbow. Yes, it's very beautiful. In fact, the legends of many cultures see the rainbow as a kind of bridge between heaven and earth. Really? Well, that's an interesting idea. But science has figured out the secret of rainbows. I can reproduce a rainbow for you using a triangular prism. Oh, how does that happen? Well, the same phenomenon takes place in both cases. Refraction of light. In this lesson, you will learn about dispersion and scattering of light. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to Identify the general terms associated with a triangular glass prism. Demonstrate refraction of light through a triangular glass prism. Demonstrate the dispersion of white light by a glass prism. Explain atmospheric refraction through twinkling of stars, apparent sunrise and sunset. Explain through the concept of the scattering of light, the Tyndall effect and reddening of the sun at sunrise and sunset. You said you could show me a rainbow through a prism. What exactly is a prism? Is a triangular glass prism a special kind of a prism? A triangular glass prism, to be specific, is a piece of glass that has two triangular and three rectangular faces. You may have studied how light refracts through a glass lamp. You can think of a prism as a triangular piece of glass carved from a white bottom glass lamp. Let's see how light refracts when the glass slab is converted to a prism. Consider ABCD, the cross-section of a glass slab of a certain thickness. A ray of light is incident on the face of the slab, represented by AB. This incident ray refracts through the path shown. After refraction through the two surfaces, the ray emerges from the face of the slab represented by DC. The surfaces of the slab represented by AB and CD are parallel. Hence, the emergent ray is parallel to the incident ray. We truncate the surface of the slab represented by CD, so that the cross-section now forms a trapezium as shown. As you can see, now the emergent ray is not parallel to the incident ray anymore. As we continue truncating the slab, the direction of the emergent ray keeps changing as shown. Finally, we get a shape with three rectangular surfaces and two triangular faces. We refer to this as a triangular prism. Wow! I can see how the emergent ray is emerging at a different angle altogether now. Yes. The shape of the prism impacts the way the incident ray refracts. The formation of a rainbow is a combined effect of refraction and another phenomenon called dispersion. Let's begin with refraction and review the general terms associated with the triangular glass prism. The rectangular faces in a triangular glass prism are known as refracting surfaces. The line along which the two refracting surfaces meet is known as the refracting edge of the prism. The angle between the two refracting surfaces, denoted by the capital letter A, is called the angle of the prism or the refracting angle. The base of the prism is the rectangular face of the prism that does not take part in refracting light. Consider XYZ the cross-section of a triangular glass prism. When a light ray PQ is incident on the face XY of the prism, it refracts at the two refracting surfaces of this prism and follows the path PQRS as shown. Now, a quick recap of the terms associated with refraction. The ray of light that is incident on a surface is called an incident ray. 
Therefore, PQ is the incident ray. Q is the point of incidence. The ray that deviates at the point of incidence due to a change in the medium is the refracted ray. In this case, the refracted ray is the ray that travels inside the prism between the two refracting surfaces. Thus, QR is the refracted ray. The refracted ray again incidents on the other surface of the prism and then emerges from it into the air. This light ray emerging from the prism after refraction is called the emergent ray. Here, RS is the emergent ray. Normal is the imaginary line drawn perpendicular to the surface at the point of incidence. The angle formed between the incident ray and the normal at the point of incidence is known as the angle of incidence. Thus, here, angle I1 is the angle of incidence on the face represented by XY. Similarly, angle R2 is the angle of incidence on the face represented by XZ. The angle between the normal and the refracted ray is known as the angle of refraction. In the absence of the glass prism, the incident light ray would follow the path PQ OQ dash. Due to the prism, the light ray emerges along the path ORS. Thus, the light ray deviates from its initial path. The angle between the directions of the incident ray and that of the emergent ray is called the angle of deviation and is represented by Greek letter delta or theta d or the English letter D. Here, angle Q dash OR is the angle of deviation. When the light ray PQ incidents at Q on the face XY of the cross section XYZ of the prism, it refracts and propagates forward inside the prism. As the light ray passes from a rarer medium, which is air, to a denser medium, which is glass, it bends towards the normal. When this refracted ray incidents on the other face of the prism XZ at R, it refracts again and becomes the emergent ray RS. Here, the light ray refracts from a denser medium, which is glass, to a rarer medium, which is air. Hence, the light ray bends away from the normal. Thus, a light ray refracts twice as it propagates through a triangular glass prism. The emergent ray always propagates towards the base of the prism. Okay, that was half the picture. What about dispersion? To understand dispersion, let's look at some videos of our annual day celebrations. I remember the amazing lighting. I wonder how they got those effects. Actually, prisms were used for those effects as well. That's where dispersion of light comes in. Light rays reflected through a prism disperse and give rise to very vibrant colors. Where do these colors come from? You'd be surprised to know that these are all constituents of white light. When a white light ray passes through a prism, it refracts and splits into its constituent colors in the process of refracting through the prism. The splitting of white light into its constituent colors is called dispersion of light. This is how you get the rainbow effect through the prism as well. Light disperses and creates a rainbow effect when it propagates and refracts in the prism. Let's conduct an experiment to see how we can create this rainbow effect through a prism. For this experiment, we take a prism on a horizontal surface as shown. On one side of the prism, we place a source of white light. Between the light source and the prism, we place a cardboard having a pinhole. This helps in producing a very narrow light beam through it, similar to that of a ray. Finally, on the other side of the prism, 
we place a white paper as shown to catch the dispersed emergent beams. This white paper acts as a screen. Can you see that strip of colors? Let's check out the order in which these colors appear from bottom to top. First is violet. Second is indigo. Next is blue. Then green. Yellow. Orange. And lastly red. The same colors as that in a rainbow. Right. Yes. I see what you mean by creating a rainbow through a prism now. To Iranian Muslims, even the brilliance of the colors in a rainbow is significant. For example, prominent green means abundance, red means war, and yellow brings death. Note, the order of colors in a rainbow is popularly identified using the acronym with GR, each letter standing for a color in order. The same order of colors is visible in a rainbow. Hmm, but a rainbow has bands of colors. Ah, don't worry. We can create bands too. Suppose you replace the cardboard having a small pinhole with the cardboard having a horizontal slit, that is, an extended light source. The vertical strip of colors you just saw expands to bring out bands of colors similar to a rainbow. There! Doesn't that look like a tiny rainbow? So, it does. Auditorium stages are also fitted with hidden rotating prisms that give exciting visual effects to support the performances on the stage. In stage lighting, several light beams are passed through rotating prisms to create spectacular effects. But why do these colors get separated when passed through the prism? When white light propagates through a prism, it refracts at an angle. However, the angle of refraction of each of constituent colors of light varies a little. This is because the frequency and hence, the wavelength of each of the constituent colors of white light is different. This leads to a difference in the refractive index of the glass for each of the colors. The difference in refractive index leads to different angles of deviation for each of the colors when light is passed through the prism. This is how we obtain a band of different colors on the screen. But there is no prism in the atmosphere. So where does the rainbow come from? I was just coming to that. Let's now solve the mystery of the rainbow. As it happens, we do have something like prisms in nature. On a sunny day, when the rainfall has just stopped, some raindrops remain suspended in the air. These drops act like refracting media, like prisms, for the sunlight. When sunlight incidents on these raindrops, it gets refracted and disperses to reveal its constituent colors. Thus, you can explain the formation of a rainbow through the concept of the dispersion of light. The refraction of light leads to a number of other phenomena that you see daily. Remember the rhyme about the twinkling stars from your childhood. Sure, I do. Well, why do you think stars twinkle? Hmm, I'm not sure. I never really thought about it. Is refraction associated with twinkling of stars? Definitely. The twinkling of stars can be explained through atmospheric refraction. Atmospheric refraction refers to the apparent random wavering or flickering of objects 
due to inconsistency in the physical conditions of the refracting media, such as air. In fact, atmospheric refraction can explain twinkling of stars as well as apparent sunrise and sunset. Let's first look at the twinkling of stars. Since our atmosphere is heterogeneous, that is, made up of many layers of various densities, the light reaching us from the sun or stars is refracted multiple times. As it crosses each medium, it refracts. Since these media or the layers of air are constantly moving, the angle of refraction of light is changing continuously. Therefore, we see the light from the stars flicker. In scientific terms, we refer to the twinkling of stars as astronomical scintillation. That's very interesting. And what were you saying about apparent sunrise and sunset? Well, not many of us realize this. But the fact is, we see the sunrise before the sun actually rises above the horizon. So, when we see the first rays of sunlight, we are actually witnessing an apparent sunrise. This happens because atmospheric refraction causes astronomical objects to appear higher in the sky than they really are. Similarly, sunset occurs shortly after the sun crosses the horizon. How does this really happen? When the sun is just below the horizon, its rays enter Earth's atmosphere and are refracted towards the Earth. The refracted rays reach us, making it appear as if the sun has already risen above the horizon. This is the apparent sunrise. The actual sunrise occurs when the sun actually crosses the horizon. Conversely, the apparent sunset occurs slightly later than the actual sunset. Since the light from the sun is already below the horizon, it refracts through the atmosphere, enabling us to see the apparent sunset even after the sun has already set. Now, another question for you. Can you tell me why the sky appears blue in color? Well, that is the natural color of the sky, I guess. If the natural color of sky is blue, then, why does it appear red during sunrise and sunset? I'm not sure. What's the reason behind it? Is it due to refraction of light as well? Not quite. It's the result of scattering of light. Scattering of light is the deviation of light rays from its straight path. Almost all objects scatter light. That is, they reflect light rays incident on them. But some objects scatter light of some specific wavelengths. Like the white ray of sunlight from the ventilator of your classroom or the golden hue in the forests. Light travels in a straight line as long as no object or particle obstructs its path. However, most media are heterogeneous like our atmosphere, which is a mixture of gas molecules and other dust particles surrounding the Earth. And as light propagates through the atmosphere, it travels in a straight path until it is obstructed by bits of dust or gas molecules, right? You got it. Out of the seven colors of light, blue has the shortest wavelength, and therefore, experiences more scattering than other colors. Therefore, the sky appears blue to us. Very interesting! Are there other examples that show the scattering of light? Sure! Scattering of light gives rise to many amazing and spectacular phenomena such as Tyndall effect, reddening of the sun at sunrise and sunset. What is the Tyndall effect? The Tyndall effect 
is the scattering of light by colloidal particles. Observe this narrow beam of light when I pass it through this colloidal solution. Wow! I can see the beam of light passing right through the solution. Yes, that is the effect of the scattering of light. When the beam of light is scattered by the colloidal particles in the solution, its path is illuminated. This phenomenon of the scattering of light is called the Tyndall effect. The illuminated path of the beam is called the Tyndall beam. Is it only in colloidal solutions that we see the Tyndall effect? No. You can observe the same even in air laden with dust particles, like in a dusty room. The Tyndall effect can also be observed when a fine beam of light enters a room through a small hole, such as an aperture in a ventilator. This happens due to the scattering of light by particles of dust and smoke in the air. Similarly, when sunlight passes through the canopy of trees in a forest, you can see the Tyndall effect at work again. The mist in the forest contains tiny droplets of water which act as particles of colloid dispersed in air. In fact, here's an interesting incident related to the Tyndall effect. London, in the summer of 1815, frequently saw prolonged and brilliantly coloured sunsets and twilights. This was explained by the Tyndall scattering of sunlight by ash particles in the upper atmosphere. These ash particles were produced by the earlier eruption of the volcano, Tambora. Now, look at this sunset. The sky has turned red. Wow! What a lovely sight! You said that the red color of the sun at sunrise and sunset can also be explained through the scattering of light. Yes. Let me explain. As the sun begins to set, light must travel farther through the atmosphere before it gets to you. Therefore, more of the light is scattered. As less direct sunlight reaches you, the sun appears less bright. The color of the sun itself appears to change, first to orange and then to red. This is because the short wavelength blues and greens get scattered. Only the longer wavelengths are left in the direct light beam, which is what reaches your eyes. Therefore, you see longer wavelengths and the sky appears red, pink or orange. Can you recall any application which you can relate to the scattering of light? I think I have heard about the red color used in danger signals, but don't know whether it relates to the scattering of light. Actually, that's a very good example. Red has a longer wavelength and hence it is least scattered in any type of the atmospheric conditions. Due to this, the signal appears without change in color for longer distances. Therefore, it is effective to indicate the danger signal universally. This brings us to the end of this lesson on dispersion and the scattering of light. In this lesson, you have learned about refraction and dispersion of light through a triangular glass prism, formation of a rainbow, atmospheric refraction, and the scattering of light.